How about instead of bickering, we figure out our next move against the speedster and his allies? Legion of Doom has a sex ring to it. I'm not calling them that. Is it smaller than a Quinjet? That's classified. And yes, considerably. It all started when we blew up the time pigs, the time masters. Now history's all screwed up, and it's up to us to unscrew it up. But half the time we screw things up even worse. So don't call us heroes, we're something else. We're legends. Who writes this crap anyway? We're chosen. and I have Dueling Guardians of the Galaxy 2 publications. I have a lowly entertainment weekly while he has a comic book, which looks awesome. I have the first issue of all new Guardians of the Galaxy number one. Very cool. By Gary Duggan and Aaron Cooter. Very cool. It looks shiny and new and mine is all dog-eared because you can mess up Entertainment Weekly. Which I've been reading. And Which, well, I don't, because uh, my recent copy that I bought of Entertainment Weekly had Twin Peaks on it. Right. So Because I this is that, last. I keep that one this really last. nice. Do you? Yes. yes, I do. Oh, see, I don't care. They're magazines. I, well, I don't get, like, the special ones I want to keep. I I'm keep, keeping I, this one. Yeah. But still, I don't care about it. Yeah. See, I'm not going to I do for my own personal be pristine with it. I mean, I'm not going to bend it. I'm as, not gonna... as, as a comic book collector, it's it's not within my power to treat magazines like crap. <laughs> I'm not going to bend on a corner. I'm not a yeah. monster. Yeah. But <laughs> Well, see what I do is like I lay them out as I'm, you know, like I have a little stand and I read and Oh, so, yeah. you're one of those. Or I just I put see. it on a table or something. And... So, but a magazine, I you know, yeah. I, I don't treat like yeah, I don't want to get my grubby fingers all over it. I see. All right. So it's episode 103, and we're going to do it in two parts because we have eight shows to cover this week. And welcome back, Karen Lindsay, to the Fan Zone you. podcast. Thank you. Sorely missed. But uh, but thankfully, we had Phil Parrish helping us yeah. out. You guys were entertaining. I loved it. I, I listened hope so. to it. I hope we were I, entertaining. I even made you a meme. Yes, I saw that. With Terry Hatcher, <laughs> because you guys made dueling pop culture references. He made a Seinfeld reference, and you made a Lois and Clark reference. Well, I make. Back I, I tend to make one or two pop culture references. Yeah, case. but I I decided to pick that one out because you guys made a different reference about the same thing right after another. So I picked that one out. Well, we definitely uh, missed you last week. I thought since Phil was on the show and I wasn't that I would make the meme for that's, last week. That's so. I think that's perfect karma. Good. And I listened to it right away. As soon as it went up, I listened to it. Yay. And I love how Phil said uh, an hour and a half. That it, It's only the Phantom Zone where that's a short episode. <laughs> hey, hey, when I described it as being short, I said I put an ish after the Yeah, end. short ish. It's right. ish. And it was only short because you didn't discuss everything. If you right. guys had discussed everything, it would have been normal. Normal, length. ungodly length. So like, right. kind, of, kind of like we're doing today. Right. But we're going to do A and B. So it's going to be short and then short. Okay. Right? I hope so. Right. Normal podcast length and a normal podcast length. <laughs> it will be if I shut up and we can get started. If I shut up and we no, can get started. I'm the one that's, that's, I'm the one at fault. Okay, so... In the first episode, which is A, 103A, we're going to be talking about Supergirl 220, City of Lost Children, Gotham 317, The Primal Riddle, Lucifer 215, Deceptive Little Parasite, The Flash 321, Cause and Effect. So uh, in this part of the episode, um, I decided that Gotham and The Flash were the two episodes we should really kind of discuss in depth so let's start with supergirl 220 city of lost children we're just going to kind of uh talk about the plot points and give our ratings and then move on to gotham sounds good to me all right so i have as my plot points desperate dax wives 
Nice. This is all one storyline. Drop your sword. Right. And here's why I say that. Nice Princess Bride reference, by the way. Thank you. Drop um, your sword. I have to get, hold on a minute, the um, keep notepad. All right. Let's uh, let's open this up. Then you have Dadception. Right, and Dabception. But here is why I use that. Um, because when she talked on the phone <laughs> to Kara, she said something like this <laughs> yeah. to the pain. And in my ears, I understand. Let's get on with it. Wrong. Your ears you keep, and I'll tell you why. So that every shriek of every child that's seeing your hideousness will be yours to cherish. Every babe that weeps at your approach, every woman who cries out, Dear God, what is that thing will echo in your perfect ears. That is what to the pain means. It means I will leave you in anguish, wallowing in freakish misery forever. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of how she talked to Kara. So. Right. That's why I put the drop your sword in. Anyway. Not not nearly as nice as how Terry Hatcher put it, but, you know. Right. <laughs> okay, and then dadception, and I'm not meaning that in an inception way. I mean it in a deception way. Ooh. Because Terry Hatcher was very deceptive towards um, Lena talking about Lena's dad and Lex. Right. Okay, so there as, was that as plot. well as being deceptive to Monel about his dad. Correct. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes, I mean that as well. It's okay, so double, that's the double Terry. There. That's the Terry Hatcher storyline. So I'm going to go through that in a minute. Um, then the B story is James. Don't call me the Manny Olson because of his caring for the boy right. in this episode. And then no crossover for this invasion. Because, of course, there's an invasion and she's not part of a crossover. So, the Terry Hatcher storyline, the, what's her name, Rhea? Yes, Rhea. Okay, so Rhea has teamed up with Lena in order to bring everyone from Daxum who survived to Earth. And Lena has this technology that will allow her to open a portal. So... That is what she has decided to do. And in order to do that... That's her big master plan. Right. In order to do that, she has to bolster Lena. She has to deceive her. So what she does is she tells her, which is actually a good thing. She kind of tells her that, you know, she's her own woman. She doesn't have to worry about being the next Lex. She doesn't have to worry about her mom, which I think is kind of evil, but also kind of good because... Lena kind of needs that pep talk, but then once she has the clay feet thing right. where Lena realizes that she's been used, I don't know how Lena's going to take that anymore, whether she's going to actually put stock into that talk anymore or not. So what I'm, concern, what I'm concerned about with Lena, though, is that she has all the, she's having some serious trust issues. Yes. And, and she's going to get burned once again. Right. By Rhea. Right. Well, she got burned already. Yeah, yeah that's true. So there's, you know, a whole nother dynamic there she, as she's, well. She's this close to shaving her head just like, mm -hmm. her, just like her brother Lex. Right. And yeah, go, she's and going, really and going full supervillain. Right. So uh, now, mind you, at the end of the episode, she gets pushed into a wall and she gets taken aboard Rhea's ship along with mon -El. And of course, we know that Rhea has plans for Mon El and, and Lena. So uh, we might see a little arrow, uh, <laughs> arrow forced marriage bit oh, in the next oh, episode. I see what you're saying. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, there's that. Uh, and we have yeah, also. But, yeah, the, but I mean, but Rhea is such a purist, a racial purist. I know, but she wants Lena and Monel to get together for some reason. I think well, she said that two episodes ago. Hmm. She tried to get Lena to I go, thought, go see, out with she him. She made such a big deal about like, well, why you know, when you know, like, why would you slum with such a you know? Oh no, they hate kryptonite, krypton, Krypto Kryptonians. Stuff. 
Right. I think that's the deal. Okay, they it's just hate she, Kryptonian. Okay, so she's cool with him being involved with Any the first race. girl as long as it's not Kryptonians. Right. Okay. Any race. Okay. It's so, not Kryptonian. Okay, so so her racism is only selective. Right. Got it. She thinks Lena is like a a really good mate for Monel because of, you know, who she is and her standing in the community and the fact that she's like a supervillain's sister. I mean, yeah. <laughs> why not? You would make the perfect daughter-in-law. <laughs> right. You're evil. <laughs> and she can she can be molded. She has a lot of scientific knowledge and all this stuff. Okay, so uh, the dadception, that's part of it. Then, of course, she uh, manipulates her son as well, who is ready to dispatch her with a gun until she guilts him she knows, big time. She knows he's a big weenie. He's, she knew he was not going to pull that trigger. Well, I think he thought about it seriously until she started talking to him. And then she guilts him. Instead of, I mean, I know she's not going to confess that she killed his right. dad, Largand, who is not Largand, but don't get me started. But anyway. Can, it, can uh, I bring up a quick question, though, about this? Yeah. Okay, that scene where Monel is holding a gun on Rhea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why does he not take, just simply take that controller from her hand? Right, he's or shoot a, her in the leg, or shoot her in the he, arm. He's or... as strong as she is, if not stronger. I know, I know. They're both Daxamites. I know. All there were many do, things he could have done. All he had to do was take that controller away. I think it, a lot of it was that, that was, she was talking to him, and it made him very weak in the moment. That was such a screamingly huge plot hole for me. I know. That that affected my grade. One, one but you have to understand that she was manipulating him in that moment it was his mother i understand that i understand he's emotionally compromised but yeah still and he could have sh like i said he could have shot her in the leg or right. the shoulder or many different things exactly but again and he she really twisted the knife when she said he killed himself over you hello right wow okay so there's that. And, uh, of course, all the ships come in. Yep. The the cliffhanger. Dun, 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 right. dun, dun. Right. Okay. And then here's what I really like. I think the writing was super tight in this episode because the other part of the episode was James and the Guardian. <sighs> I know you didn't like that, but wait a minute. Okay. James and the Guardian, which wasn't a huge deal until he met with the kid and their family and they were having issues because because Rhea and her part of the storyline crossed over with it. So all of the story intertwined with each other, which they have not done all season. Right. The the B story and the A story and the C story have never meshed all season. And I think they tightened the writing up in this episode to such a degree that it made this story much more cohesive, at least in my opinion. And I see you don't like it as much as I do, yes. but uh, I really do like this. And I like the fact that James has kind of figured out that maybe he doesn't need to be this guardian anymore, that he had the chat with the boy and he had his, his camera, he talks about his dad, he talks to uh, Jean several times about being the Guardian and that he doesn't have to be. He can help in other ways. Uh, he talks to Wynn and he, I think he realizes that maybe he doesn't have to be this. Maybe they can fit him back into the plot without him being this hand-wavy character. Well, I hope so because for me it just came across as – Oh, it's more of we have no idea what to do with James's character. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna have him be all right, now that we've made him be wishy washy about being guardian, we're gonna and but then he gets over that, we're gonna have him be wishy washy again and start questioning whether he should keep doing it. Well, I am hoping that this is them thinking we had no idea what to do with him. 
the fans of the show realized that and we decided to stop the whole guardian thing <laughs> and I did bring like... him go ahead what no go no, ahead no 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 i was just going to say i'm glad they recognized that hey maybe um having with james having the back of a frying pan as his guardian mask that maybe that is not exactly the most inspirational look right. he could it's have. It's a little intimidating. A little bit. Yeah. And that he's scaring people. Right. And I thought that was good that he realized that, you know, perhaps that's not his calling. Right. So let's hope that's it. Uh, so that's pretty much the episode. I'm not going to get into more detail. I thought there was a lot of good writing in this episode. The uh, director of this episode is a, a stuntman. Yeah, we forgot, and I thought we forgot to read. I forgot to read the uh, credits here. So yeah, this was teleplay by Gabriel Lanis and Anna Muskie Goldwyn, directed by Ben Bray. Right, and Ben Bray is a he was a stunt man on a lot of shows, uh, these shows in particular, and uh, I thought he did a a really good job with the directing, especially the fight scene with uh, Rhea and them, even though it wasn't completely necessary i mean it right. should have been something else but that fight scene was good so um i i really kind of dug this episode so what did you give it yeah you didn't dig it yeah i did not dig it mostly because it was such a heavy james episode right and until they get james's character figured out it was a drag for me personally right so i don't i have nothing against the actor i think mm -hmm. his character is being written poorly McCod Brooks that's, is good. That's all. Mm -hmm. I like Jimmy Olsen as a, you know, in the comics, mm -hmm. but I don't like this version of Jimmy. Okay. The, the way he's being written. So I gave it seven Einstein Rosen Bridges, which is the fancy schmancy scientific name for wormholes. Right. Which is what which they're is, doing. Which is what the portal is. Essentially, it's a, a way to warp space so that all these Daxamite vessels can come across so much, you know, so far right? Uh, and invade Earth. So right. we, we get invasion to the re-invasioning. Right. Exactly. And uh, I'm betting there's going to be some Dominators on there, yeah. right? Or is what because... Rhea, yeah, hopefully. Hopefully we get some Dominators because what also what uh, Rhea refers to as welcome to new Daxum. Yep. And the fact that uh, what are the what's the race that Linda Carter is the dove from has a V in it? <sighs> oh, you mean oh yeah yeah you mean her alien? Yeah, yeah yeah the the uh, Durlins. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it doesn't the, have a V. In it. <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't because the only reason I remember that because a chameleon boy. So right, yeah, yeah from right. the Legion of Superheroes. So yeah, Durlins. so Durlin. Durlins and Daxums have a huge rivalry in the comics at a certain point. So I'm thinking that maybe she will help with the invasion and that her race is going to be the big bad next season. That was my prediction on Made of Steel this week. Okay. So, uh, okay. And, and then I we gave also, it. Then we also know we have a certain Kryptonian making his long awaited appearance. Mm hmm. Reappearance. Reappearance. I should right. Say. Yes. And next week, Linda Carter's coming back as well. Awesome. So that's why I think the Durlins might come back. Well, yeah, because Wonder Woman. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the Durlins can shapeshift. Right. So next season, if they can't get Linda Carter back, it doesn't matter because it can be anybody. Right. They could just recast the role really easily. Exactly. All right. Uh, so I gave it eight and a half found cameras because. While you think it was Jimmy uh, being wishy-washy, I think he might have made up his mind in this episode. And again, it's, I hope you know, so. I hope you're right. Right. It's just us having a difference of opinion. I'm hoping is, this they, this will be the conduit to fixing his character at last. Right. It's been right. two seasons. They need to get him figured out. Or, I agree. Or just cut him from the show. Right. I think he should be kind of a win-ish character, except on the Alex side of things. Right. Like, Alex doesn't have powers. She helps out plenty. That would have been the way the way to start the show from season one is make Jimmy the win character mm -hmm. on Supergirl. But I like win. Right. So 
I just think they should cut CatCo altogether. Make it all the DEO. Yeah. Make him be law enforcement yeah, like maybe, Alex. Maybe he joins the DEO. Right. Yeah. I mean, he was pretty chummy with uh, with Jean. Right. Which I kind of liked. I like to see and those John two. And Jean encouraged I, him. I like to see those two characters bonding. Me too. John encouraged him to, you know, go into law enforcement, just maybe in a different way. Right. So, okay. On to Gotham. Gotham. Which was awesome this week. Uh, 317, The Primal Riddle. Yeah, written by Stephen Lillian and Brian Winbrandt, directed by Maha Vervillo. Okay. Awesome. Yep. They did a great job. Yeah, uh, yeah I enjoyed this one a lot. Spoilers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, A-story courting trouble. Court. Dang. Yeah, I see what you did there. Trouble. Uh, B-story mother mayor I. I like that title a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Very cool. Uh, C-stories. Team up with Captain Cold and Heatwave. Heatwave. Right. And then, I'm not Batman. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not Batman. Because someone admitted that he's not Bruce in this episode. Yeah. Oh, okay, so we have five who has realized that he is kind of degrading a little bit. Uh, his nose bleeds. He did not let Alfred win. I'm doing air quotes. Yes. Uh, when Alfred sees that he is a little weak in the chess game. So he calls the Court of Owls. He is pretty quick on the gun to call Catherine and say, uh, hey, I might get discovered. I was really glad to see that nosebleed, by the way. Mm-hmm, me too. Because I was just and like, get rid of him. Get, get, get him out. This <laughs> explains why Bruce is still alive right. for me. Because in the last episode, which we didn't get to talk about, right. I felt like, why did they not just kill Bruce and replace him with five? But now we know that they have to bring Bruce back. So they're well, going to do something. Well, they didn't end- replace him. They just well, yeah. Kill- they just didn't kill him. But it's a temporary thing. I was thinking they, obviously you know, they could pl- just replace him. Yeah, and- they have plans for Bruce. Right. So they're going to indoctrinate him at some in some way, brainwash him or something, and then put him back in. Yeah. Um, so the question was, you know, why didn't they just permanently replace him? Well, they didn't want to make the but... disappearance uh, obvious. So. Well, that's what I'm saying. They could have made five into a better Bruce. Right. But, but maybe, they didn't may- need to because. Maybe they, maybe they realized that five was not stable and was going to break down and. Go away that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that that's why they did it that way. Um, but yeah. you know, before they let us in on that secret, I wondered why. Right. They and now, didn't. And now we know. And, and knowing, now it's clear. And right. Knowing is half the battle. Mm-hmm. GI Joe. <laughs> the more you know. Do do do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rainbow. Right. I think we had Starry a thread Rainbow. on. A thread on Facebook with those logos. Anyway, um, so now we know why Five is not going to be a permanent replacement. Uh, he realizes that he is not long for this world, but Catherine assures him that Bruce will be back before he dies. Uh, and he lets on that it's not Alfred that he cares about, but it is Selena that he cares about. So now the the court knows his weakness. Well, he cares about her so much. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a yeah, second. Yeah, I figured we would. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they let him go, and I'm assuming they did something. They gave him something, a treatment, maybe. Maybe. The Court of a, Owls. A tune-up. I'm assuming he needs some medicine sometimes when that happens. Right. Or something. So um, they they did something to him, and he, he left. He's still not himself. He goes to see Selena, and I loved the scene with Selena alone. Yes. Where she goes to the place where she's squatting because she doesn't have a place. And there's a cat there, which is awesome. Yeah, anytime she's you get Selena cat. with cats, yeah. So great. She has such a great relationship with this cat. She's feeding the cat, talking to the cat, 
telling it, you know, well, I'm not going to sleep here, so eat up. And, you know, she's just, she doesn't show that she loves the cat, but you can tell she loves the cat. Well, well that's kind of her, the, her cat-like personality. I right. Can't, I can't show you how much I care for you. But, well, because you're not going to be in my life very long. Right. So I can't get attached. I'm not going to get I, But I am. You're right. I mean. I bet I'm not going to show it. Right. Yeah. Because if I show it, then it'll yeah. be true. Right. Uh, so then, you know, five shows up and he, he actually kind of does that batman sort of voice. That A little bit. A little husky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Selena realizes that there's something going on with him and she is not happy. You know, she rebuffed him in the last episode. So well, she's telling him that revelation. You know, I was so surprised that he just came out and told her, Hey, I'm not Bruce. Right. Except for, I think he's kind of backed into the corner. I did not expect that. So I was glad to see that. I think again, I think he's backed into a corner. Although the fact that he does come out with it instead of making up an excuse was interesting. Yes. So, and I think it's because he has these feelings for her and that he thinks she will accept him as five. Right? <clears throat> right. But I think that's why he does it. Thanks for playing. Here's a here's a copy of our home game. Right. So, he doesn't remember the last time they talked that she said to go away, which again, I think is a side effect of whatever's happening with him. But she <laughs> she reminds him in not so subtle terms. They have kind of a fight, but he tells him he tells her, you know, I'm five. I'm not Bruce. And uh, they have another fight. And I love the way that this show does this kind of setting up the scene with lighting and blocking and stuff. Right. Because. He is on the side of the apartment with the window when he reveals that he is not Bruce. So the light is on him like he's bringing himself out into the the light. Out out of the shadows, yes. Right. And then they trade places where he goes into the shadows and she's in the light after that. Well, that darkness falls over him. Right. When he realizes that she is not going to yeah. return any feelings and he goes dark yep. you know so he goes into the shadows and she goes into the light to let him know and she comes out and says I am not going to return those feelings and she tells him in no uncertain terms you're not Bruce Bruce would not do this Bruce would care about the city not just me so she lays it on the line. So she is coming. She is open. Right. And in the light. Well, it, it also gets her, gives us a little insight into her real, why she likes Bruce. Right. That he is unselfish. Right. And that she, she sees that he and is just. Because a, everybody else has motives. Right. And, he is just a good person. Right. And that's mm-hmm. what. She wants, I think, you know, she she knows she's not that person, but she likes him for being that person. Exactly. Right. Which I think is fantastic to see that. Right. Um, That we get a lot of background on things. Um, And the fact that we get information, we got so much information about Bruce in this episode without even seeing him, which... Is amazing to me that we get so much backstory on all these characters and they don't even have to be in the episode. And, it, you know, that's one of the brilliant things about Gotham this season is how they write everything. That it's been just so tight and, and amazing this season, I think. Tighter, uh, how tighter, about you? Tighter than it has been. Yes, I, this season is yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, compared to last season. Yes, I think this season uh, this is a stronger season than it was last season. It, it gets better each season. Yeah, and well, uh, I'm so glad it was renewed for next season yeah, as we, well. Yeah, yeah, for those who don't know, Gotham was picked up for season four. Yep, but uh, all these shows have been renewed, right? Everything. 
Yeah, pretty much. We are going to be really busy in the fall. Yeah. I Zombie was renewed. These were the last ones. Agents of Shield was renewed, uh, and Lucifer Gotham. They were all renewed. Right. So. And on okay. top of that, we we've got new shows. Krypton was picked up by Sci Fi. Right. Black Lightning was picked up by the CW. Right. Uh, and the X Men series, The Gifted, was picked up by Fox. I know. <laughs> So it's crazy. I'm thinking we're going to have to actually start picking and choosing what we're going to review. We are. Because I, I, we are. I have to think eight is our absolute limit for a show. Yeah. So if it goes over eight, we have to start cutting. Yeah, I think so too. We're going to have to pick out the ones that are yeah. really good that week. Right. Before we do all that, though, we need to talk about what happens after Selena drops the it's not me. Exactly. It's you, Bob. So the fact that she's in the light unfortunately means that she's in the window, which gives five the opportunity to push her out. A la Batman, Batman Returns. Returns. <laughs> yeah, we get we get a big Batman Returns homage here because Selena gets shoved out the window just like Max Shrek did to her as an adult in Batman Returns. Right, and, and it looks and so it, much like Michelle Pfeiffer. Well, not out the, the window. Not only because Cameron Bikendova, who plays Selena, looks so much like Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman. Yep. Exactly. So when she goes out that window, she hits her head just like mm-hmm. Selena did. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. And a swarm of cats come out of the woodwork, out of the shadows, and start circling around her, just like in Batman Returns. I know. Now, that is not how she's going to be revived, by the way. I mean, if we she, do now, get... now she wakes up and she starts, like, uh, stitching together her vinyl coat <laughs> after after shredding it into pieces. No, no. And then bashing uh, out lights that say, we got instead some... of hello there, they say, now, hell here. We got some hints that um, Ivy's going to be helping her heal right. next next episode. So please, no uh, miraculous cat licking yeah. uh, revival. Uh, and by the way, during the hiatus, Gotham Undercover actually talked about one. We did three movies, and right. one of them was Batman Returns. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, you know, if she weird. if Ivy does end up helping Selena, Penguin is currently hanging with Ivy. Right. So that means so she we might get, be part of their gang. So Selena and Penguin might be hanging out together. Yeah. And Penguin Penguin may lay back in his bed going, "A plan is forming." <laughs> right. <laughs> Again with the Batman returns. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So penguins and cats might be living together, mass hysteria. Exactly. Is that what you're saying? Yep. <laughs> stripes reference. Yep. Or is that is that a stripes reference? That's a no. That's, that's a Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. That's Ghostbusters reference. reference. Bill Murray, maybe. Exactly. Okay. Now um, team up with Captain Cold and Heatwave. Let's move right into that since right. you're talking about. And I think it's funny that we get Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze to you. And fire. Oh, Firefly. Firefly. Yeah, Firefly. So, yeah, and of uh, course they don't like each other because fire and ice. Get exactly. It? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Fire, Firefly is all like, keep him away from me. Right. And we have this band of misfits, and the reason they're teaming up is because they have a mutual benefit to teaming up with Penguin. Right. Uh, first of all, Penguin has Captain Cold's suit, which can help him immensely. And he promises him if he comes with him, he can get him a cure. And Heatwave gets to leave her job and she literally burns her bridges at her job. Yeah. <laughs> that was just like the ultimate, like, you know, like I quit scene. Yes, it was. Like, like I'm going to scoop up some molten metal, fling. Right in your it face. Was so awesome. And then I'm like, I quit out the door. And then it Johnny. It's like a lottery winner, and right? Then, and then Johnny Paycheck song, uh, Take This Job and Shove It, starts playing. Yeah, so great. Take this job and shove it. Shove it. I ain't I'm working, working here, here no, no more. more. Yeah. It was so great. So Ivy is his ambassador because Oswald is not the smoothest of cats. And I don't mean cats as in meow. I mean cats as in hey, cat. Hey, daddy. Uh, right. 
so Ivy is the one who explains to both Freeze and Firefly that, hey, look, I'm a misfit too. Oswald can do stuff for you. You should come with us because once we get together and get our revenge on, you know, the city in general and the people that did this to us, we can actually get better. Right. He can get a secure or whatever we need. And, uh, and so they have this mutually beneficial relationship and, and that's where we end up here. And of course they're not happy with each other, but who cares? You know, they're going to get what they want out of the relationship. So that's where it goes. Now, Riddler. Yeah. Well, obviously. Let's talk about Riddler. Well, yeah, because the primal riddle right there, it just shows you what a big, mm. but a big Riddler episode this was. Another reason why I like this episode. Ed is not Ed anymore. Nope. He has shunned that name. He is the Riddler. Yep. And I'm moving into the Riddler from here because once Oswald and his band gets back into town, they see a news report. I, I and was it, just going to bring that up. And he, he sees that he's being called the Riddler, and he says, how long did that take for you to think of? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is awesome because he's the Penguin, and that's pretty obvious too, dude. So, right. <laughs> you know, don't talk about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, glass, look at your band. Glass houses there, Penguin. Right. And not just you, but everybody you're surrounded with. Right. Ivy with the plants. Hello. And then Cap, or not Captain Cold, but... Mr. Freeze. Freeze. Yeah. And Firefly. Come on. Yeah. But yeah, Nigma now as the Riddler is making this huge splash. Oh. He's totally, he's like dialed 100 into being a supervillain. He's, you know, like, he saw, I, can, I think he got it probably inspired by Jer- Jerome. Yes. And so... He has this cult, yeah. and he decides he wants... Well, he li- he likes the showmanship. He wants he wants to to put on that that show for everybody. Right, and he likes to put on a show. He likes the attention. He likes to put on a show for whoever it is appropriate for at the time, and he puts on shows throughout the episode. He puts on a show for Tabs, Babs, and Butch. Right. When he's talking to them, right. He puts on a show for Jim alone when he's alone with Jim. Uh, he puts on a show for the world when he's talking on the television. I mean, it's it's a show all the time when he's on, quote unquote. Um, and then when he's behind the scenes, he's behind the scenes. He's still the Riddler, but he's always planning behind the scenes. And then he goes on stage and it doesn't matter how many people are watching him. He does his performance. And I love that they show him like this because that is the Riddler. And I love that also when he does his planning, he's talking to Barb and Tabitha and Butch are sitting there as well. And they come up with this plan. And Barbara, poor Barbara, is being manipulated. And all she sees are, you know, power signs. Instead of dollar signs, because right. with her, it's about the power. With, with well, Ed... Well, well with, Be- with Stabby Babs, she's like, she wants to be in control. Right. And this is where she's coming into conflict with Tabitha. Right. Because Tabitha just kind of wants to live their life, right? And right. if they have to commit some crimes, who cares? You know, they can run their little empire. and do, But the, she wants to do it together. Which is the whole point. Um, And we'll talk about them in a minute. But uh, there's wealth all around Ed. But he doesn't give a crap about that. Nope. He wants to know the answer. And he was given this riddle a year ago. Of the Court of Owls. Right. Who runs Gotham? And that's what he wants the answer to. And... It, dri- it, dri- it drives him nuts, more nuts, not knowing. Right. And little did we know, he was never given the answer to that. He was just asked to ask that. Right. So that's kind of the thing he wants to know. And 
he goes to people that he thinks can move him up that chain. You get me the mayor. The mayor can get me here. This person can get me here. This person can get me here. And he has this whole plan up the ladder. And he has riddles throughout. And, you know, who can get me to whoever runs Gotham? That's what I want to know. So they kidnap the mayor. And Stabby Babs is on board 100% with that. Uh, they uh, intimidate him by having the thing over his head. And Baz is like, do you recognize my voice? Which I love. And he's like, I do. Who are you? <laughs> oh, we put your bo- your head in a box last time. No, let's do whatever. that. Again. Let's, let's do that again. Yeah, exactly. And uh, she said, he said, Ed says, um, who are these people that are influencing the, the, the people of Gotham. And he says, I can't tell you that. And Bab says, well, maybe we can put your head back in the box. Okay. I'll tell you everything. Uh, (laughs) Of course. uh, uh, The guy who plays the mayor. Richard Richard Kind. Thank you. Richard Kind. He plays Aubrey James. Oh, he's so fantastic. And whatever he does, I love him as the mayor. Uh, I love him. Anytime I see him anywhere. And he chews he the was, scenery. He, he was great as Molt in The Bug's Life. If you ever oh, seen. yes. Right? So good. So good as Molt. Yes. Um, he was good on Mad About You. He was good on the show with Michael J. Fox, the yeah. political show. Spin, Spin City. Spin yeah. City. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's, that's where I first noticed him, obviously. Me too. Uh, so, I mean, just everywhere he is, he's good. And he's good as the Weasley mayor in this, too. So, which I'm he, still trying to figure out, like, okay, you know, and I think I brought this up last week is like, okay, we have even after all the crap that Mayor Aubrey James does, and everybody knows it, they still bring him back. Of course, what what choice do they have? They could have an a, election, they could have got a city councilman, they could have got a deputy mayor. It's Gotham, still, just saying, <laughs> they don't have a deputy mayor. They that could, was Ed, they, yeah. Well, they could have had somebody else, you know, in the administration. Whatever's whoever's third in line in that administration. Made for a better show. I know. <laughs> I get it. But still. So he he gets uh intimidated into giving out some information, which leads Ed to who? To who? To Gordon. Yes. So Gordon, of course, is Already, and we're into the courting trouble area of yeah. this. Yeah, because uh, Jim is getting recruited by uh, Catherine, mm-hmm. played by Leslie Hendricks in this. And... and I also think there's a bit of a long game happening with James because he did not kill his uncle, his uncle killed himself. Right. But he says to Catherine, I killed my uncle. Isn't that good enough for you? And she brings that's him in. Kind of, yeah, that's kind of his initiation. And she says, no, there's other stuff you need to do. So he he has a plan. He wants to get on the board or on the court and, and maybe see what they're doing behind the scenes. Maybe take them down from within. Because well, they were they had a hand in killing his dad. Yeah. Right? And he's well, not on board. No, no. He's obviously intent on taking them down, mm-hmm. but he realizes the only way to do that is to do it from the inside. Right. Which is why at the end of the episode, we see him getting introduced to the court and he dons one of those lame Gotham versions of the Court of Isle masks that really, right. really should be the right. comic book versions because the comic book versions are much cooler. Much better, yes. Yeah. More like the Talon masks. Yeah, these the are comic. all frilly and girly. And I, I know they're I lame. Like, well, don't... they look like owl faces. Yeah, but so do the others. They're just I more know. streamlined. And, I know. And they're much more foreboding. And they also should be in a lot more shadows, I think. Right. They ha- they look kind of like Hawkman masks yeah, yeah. in the comics. Right. Okay, so uh, in between the beginning and the end of that, uh, he decides that bringing Ed in might help solidify that and there's all this talk about ed finding out so 
instead of exposing the court of owls, which is what Ed wants to do, you know, he comes up with this brilliant plan. What do shadowy organizations not want to happen? They don't want to come out of the dark. So they put Aubrey in a collar bomb and they threaten to blow him up blow if up they real don't good. if they don't give up the information about the court of owls about you know whatever shadowy organization it is and james has nothing to lose by giving him the option he does which is you're going to kill the mayor anyway if i don't give you the information so go ahead if you kill him you're not going to get the information let him go, if and I'll take him, you to the court of owls. Learn nothing. Right, right. So let him go, and I'll take you to the court. That's the only thing you're going to get. So go ahead. Yep. Kill him or come with me. Those are the two options you have. And of course, what is Ed going to do? He has to go with James. And James does that little bit of twisting before they go to the court of owls. He takes him down to the docks. Where all these things have happened to Ed that just, it's like memory lane for him, right? Exactly. Well, you remember, obviously, that's where, yeah, Ed dumped the penguin into the river. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And they reminisce about his past love life, and (laughs) it's just like... Like, hey, remember, yeah, remember Miss Kringle and... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just there's pushing some... on pushing all his buttons. Yeah, there's a bit of uh nastiness going down between the yeah. two of them. And then he meets Catherine, and Catherine decides that this is a great thing. They can really use him. And uh not that he's going to become part of the court, but they can use him. And I'm guessing it's going to be something like and not sciency or medicine wise but something like how they used Hugo. Right. As in he's not part of the court, but they can use his intellect. I think, I, obviously, I think uh, Nigma is going to be, Edward is going to be like regretting letting his curiosity get the better of it. Yep. He sure is. Because he's going to be a pawn in their game. He's not going to be the, the, the uh, knower only, of all. Riddler only pawn in Game of Life. Right. <laughs> now, uh, that, of course, is the linchpin that cements the fact that James is going to be loyal to the Court of Owls, and they induct him into the court, and he ends up in the mask. Yep. And then there's the whole thing with, just as a last little note, with Babs, Tabs, and Butch, where yep. Tabs... Uh, kind of subverts Bab's plans. Well, by... well, Butch has been whispering in Tabitha's ear. Okay, that... and I, I have to say, yes, Butch is like Gotham personified, right? Where he's a bad guy, but his love for Tabitha makes him good. Right. He has a very unselfish love for Tabitha, where he knows that Tabitha doesn't love him the way she, the way he loves her. But he wants what's best for her. Right. So he urges her to not let Barbara use her. Does that make sense? I was getting more of the vibe that he was playing both against each other, but you bring up yeah, a good Yeah, he good kind point. of is. He, but, but you bring up a good point that obviously he's loyal to Tabitha because he cares about her. Right. Right. So And he, he just brings up the fact that don't let her use you. Yeah, cause, which is why you see Butch smirking. Every time, like, Tabitha gets mad at Babs and storms off, and he's just sitting there going, ha, 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 ha. Of course he wants her to to leave Babs. Right. Of course he does. So he's happy. But he doesn't say leave her. He says, you know, I know that you're into her more than you're into me. He, You know, he fully admits that. Right. And his love for her is true, I think. And and as pure as Butch can get as far as love goes. And that part of him is good. He's very gray as far as evil people go in Gotham. Um, and I think ba- uh, Tabs is gray as well. You know, she she wants to be powerful, but she doesn't want to be this 
super villain. Well, uh, obviously, obviously, and, Stabby Babs is more has more uh, initiative than she does. More, more malevolence. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, she's more unhinged. Right. Uh, so she subverts her plans by giving the this disarm code to the neck bomb to James so that they can get the mayor out of that mess. And uh, Babs is not happy with that. So we have a bit of a situation there. Right. Okay. So that's pretty much it, right? Yeah, I think so. But such a great Riddler episode. So much insight into these characters. And uh, a lot of development with almost every character on the show. Yeah, definitely moving things forward, which is always great. Mm-hmm. Instead of just spinning its wheels. Yeah. So, so what was your rating? I give it eight and a half wedlock from the Rutger Hauer movies, Neck Bombs. Oh, okay. Did, did you ever see that I've movie? I've never seen that movie. Oh, you need to see it. Okay. It uh, Just quickly. Yeah. Uh, it's a prison, but there's no walls. Got it. So they, uh, that's how they keep the prisoners in line. Well, what it is is you have a neck bomb and you have a partner with the same neck bomb. Uh, and if you get too far apart from that partner, you both blow up. Right. So that's how they keep you within the boundaries of the prison. So and it, Rutger Hauer has a female partner. Right. And they decide they're going to run away together. So anyway, which would, the, which would think be kind of a flaw. It's like, well, and then all you have to do is just get both of them to. You can't go far away from the prison either. OK, that makes more sense. Yeah. OK. Okay. Okay. You should and, see the movie. It's good. Wedlock. Yeah. Um, I like this one even more than you did. I gave it nine swarming cats. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Really good. Love the Batman Returns reference, obviously. That, that was, was the part that was rolling my eyes at, that but the, I loved it too. That was the know? first movie that Lori and I saw together. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. Stargate was the first movie that Sean and I saw together. Okay. And then Pulp Fiction. Right. So at the Dollar Theater. Both of those. Cool. cool. As friends. All right. Uh, okay, so Lucifer 215, Deceptive Little Parasite. Love that title, by the way. Me too. Well, it's a line from the episode, but. Mm hmm. It always is. Referring to Trixie. Mm hmm. So big Trixie episode. Huge. Yep. Which is always an upgrade for Lucifer. Agreed. Yeah, so written by Mike Costa and Julia Fontana, directed by Brad Tenenbaum. Nice. Okay, Trixie Morningstar is way better than Candy Morningstar, is my A story. Yep. <laughs> is she a watery tart? Nice. That would be a reference to Monty Python, right. obviously. And Mommy, May I Sleep Without Danger. Very nice. A reference to the movie Mommy, May I Sleep With Danger. Right. And that's Trixie, but yeah, it's you, Trixie. You can't get enough Trixie. Yeah, there's two Trixie storylines, really. Right. Trixie being insecure about her mother and then the whole school storyline. Yep. Uh, so quickly, the school storyline is actually the murder, uh, where a woman from the school is murdered, and it's uh, the touchy-feely teacher from the school has done it. And she is played by Shauna Malway Tweep from Parks and Recreation, <laughs> which you haven't seen. Which I haven't seen, but yes, right. that's, that's and, obviously how you know her. And the headmaster is played by Eldon from, from the Cosby, Cosby Show. Show. Now, him I recognized. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, him I recognized. <laughs> At first, I had to do a double. I had to explain this to Lori because it was like, wow, Eldon really put on weight <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> since the Cosby Show. Well, it, I mean, he's older. He's older. 50 pounds, maybe. Yeah. 40 pounds, something just, like but that. I, but what it was is the eyes. He has these yeah. very distinctive eyes. Mm -hmm. And then I was just like, I know this guy from somewhere. And then I had to think about it. I was like, holy crap, that's Eldon from The Cosby Show. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly is. Um, but people that watch Parks and Rec, you know Shauna Malway Tweep. She, she was a reporter on the show. And okay. she kind of slept around and ah. all kinds of stuff. She was a nice character, though. Okay, so uh, she was the the murderer. That's what it ended up being. 
uh, and they spent a lot of time on the sh- in, in the school. And one of the funny storylines was that when Lucifer was trying to help with the case, he took Trixie into the school as his daughter. Right. <laughs> and at the same time, well, yeah, that was the, that was the whole big thing that um, Lucifer offers to take Trixie to her normal school. Right. And then it said, like, okay, we're gonna like do a little sidetrack to the the Starford School, and that's when Trixie introduces herself as Trixie Morningstar. Right, which, which was, was awesome. Which was great. Because she is so smart and she thinks on her feet. Right. And it's and she, and she through, enjoys being with Lucifer. All through this episode you can see that. And we'll talk about more we'll more talk about her thinking on her right. feet during the other storyline. Um but also I thought it was funny that Dan and Chloe show up at the school and learn that Lucifer has brought their daughter in and the headmaster says that she was brought in by her dad. Right. And Dan says, uh, I highly doubt that (laughs) (laughs) because he is their dad, her dad, of course. So that's really, do you think think Trixie has thought about Lucifer becoming her new dad? Yes. Many times. I think she wants that to happen. Right. Well, she's mentioned to Chloe several times that, she kind of wonders if they have more of a relationship than what right. they have. Right. Uh, and I think she would love that to happen. She loves Lucifer, Lucifer. And I think Lucifer has a m- bigger fondness for her than he lets on. Yeah, because he just refers to as the child or... Well, he doesn't know what to do yeah, with her. Or, as he, in this episode, that, that deceptive little parasite. Exactly. But I think he loves the fact that she lies and thinks on her feet and yeah. does all that stuff. Um, okay, so uh, Mommy May I Sleep Without Danger is a side storyline to that where while they are in the school, they talk to the murderess who is, of course, this kind of counselor person in the school. And they're going around and talking about things and they're getting out their feelings. And Trixie who is thinking on her feet, but also probably telling a bit of the truth, Right. talks about how her mother is in danger all the time and how she worries about her. Well, and then she doesn't want to talk to her mom about it because her mom has so many responsibilities. She doesn't want her mom to worry about her. Right. So she just bottles it up inside. Right. And Chloe hears this. Mm-hmm. Right. So – There's a reaction from Chloe and also Lucifer, who is sitting next to her in the room, has a reaction as well. Right. We should should, should point out that Lucifer is there using Trixie to learn about how to get in touch with your emotions Mm -hmm. so that he can use this sword, which we'll get into. Right. Exactly. He has to get in touch with her. Of course, it's Lucifer. He has an ulterior motive. Of course. Yeah. But also when this happens, he realizes that Trixie and he have a bit in common where not only do they bottle up their feelings, but they both have the same sort of feelings about Chloe where they worry about her getting hurt. And I think it's a bonding moment for the two of them. And uh, it's really touching to see them together. Uh, And then, of course, that feeling gets broken a little bit later when he steals a book a picture book from the the school and he's reading it in the bar which i think it's hilarious yeah in it's Lu- like he's reading it in lux yeah, yeah which it it says something like how to get in touch with your feeling is on a cartoon font on the front yeah it's, all, like it's, a it's obviously sea a kid, dog run obviously and, the kid's book yes all in bright colors and it's very funny uh, and Maze is trying to get him to to do something else, and he's like, "No, I'm reading this book." And she looks at him funny, and it's just a funny scene. But during that time, uh, sh- his mother comes over to him where he's trying to search his feelings. You know it to be true. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, she comes over and brings these girls over, three girls that look similar to Chloe. Right. And proposes that he has a foursome. 
He calls it a triple decker. Which I thought was hilarious. The best line ever. Yes. I thought that right? was that was gold. I, I tweeted about that. I was just like, that was perfection. The triple, triple decker. Deckle. My favorite line from the whole episode. Because I think. obviously Chloe's last name is Decker. So yeah. Right. Great pun. Yes. And my runner up was when he walks in on a Menadiel switching swishing the sword around and says you'll go blind if you play with that too much. <laughs> So that's my second favorite line of the whole episode, uh, which is great. Uh, So there's those two scenes there, which I just wanted to pull out. Uh, But he and Trixie bond during this episode, which is great. And then uh, Trixie and her mother have a bit of conversation about how she feels. And there's a little forward movement there. Uh, I think that Lucifer needs to open up to Dr. Linda more. That's just my opinion. Uh, on that, he well, does talk Dr. to Dr. Obviously, Linda. Obviously, Dr. Linda thinks so, too. Yeah, he talks to Dr. Linda. Dr. Linda does a thing where she asks him a question and then sits there, and he already knows that this is when she wants an answer. Yep. So he says that to yeah. her. Yeah. Uh, you have that look like you want me to answer. <laughs> well, he does open up to her later. Right, at the end a of the little ep- bit. A little at the end of the episode where he talks about, like, yeah, um, where he's talking about the using the sword, but he right. wants, to, he's like, he wants to, he reveals his plan right, to her that he's going to shut the, the gates of heaven to lock his mom and his dad, God and Charlotte, together, together. so that they can, like, destroy each other or whatever. Right. And... He's not going back. No, but he's like, that's the punishment. He's like, I don't care. Right. I don't know, I have no interest in going back to the Silver City. Right. I just want these two to get, like kill each other and get off my back. Right. <laughs> so, um, and then he talks about, Linda tells him, like, the only way to manage that pain is to go through it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And to manage that pain, I think, is what's going to make the sword come to life. Right. And he needs to open up to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's going to have something to do with Chloe, and, obviously. And obviously, um, Charlotte has a vested interest in that sword. She is desperate to get back to the Silver City. As we find out that apparently something is not right with Charlotte. Right. And she's like, uh, she pulls back this bandage that shows that there's light coming from the wound. Mm-hmm. So there's something going on with her physical form. Mm-hmm. So she may be actually disappearing. Or breaking down. We don't know. Right. Right. So she's obviously desperate to get back to save herself. And she right. gets kind of angry with Lucifer because he's not able to um, use uh, the sword, uh, uh, the blade of Uriel. Right. Right. So, Which he put into the wall of his apartment. Right. Yeah, he hit it. <laughs> I thought that was cool. Yeah, so, yeah, it just kind of blended into the wall, so he pulls it right out. Mm-hmm. And he tries to use it. He starts using it, but he doesn't have enough emotion. He's not in touch with his emotions enough to keep using it. Right. And so that's why they, they go down the whole road of Lucifer trying to figure out how to use his emotions so we can keep using the sword. Right. Right. I thought that was a great scene too when the sword actually does kind of flame a little bit right. and he's crying and you know he's thinking about Chloe. Right? Right. His strongest feelings were when he's thinking about Chloe. Right. And like how he really wants to be with her but he feels like he can't because she doesn't have a choice in the matter and you just know that has to be it. And it's so sad to me. I want him to be with her so bad. Well, that's the whole point. The, the shit, I know. They're trying to get you to want that so that it can screw with you and jerk you around but keep you watching. I know. I kind of don't want them to get together. It's the will they or won't they. I kind of don't want them to well, because I like their relationship. But right. then there's part of me that wants them to as well. But, you know, I think Lucifer might should be tortured. <laughs> you right. know, he is Lucifer. I see what you're so. saying. Yeah. Okay. Anything so, else about this episode? I don't think so. Okay. So what did you give it? Uh, I gave it eight and a half out of ten 
flaming letter openers because <laughs> and that's a reference to a, a line from the Hobbit movie, the first Hobbit movie, where uh, Bilbo gets the sword and one of the uh, like dwarves mention like you know like well it's it's not really a sword it's more of a letter opener really because it's, <laughs> Cause it's, cause uh, it's cause more it's, like a dagger because it's more of like a short sword. Okay. So the, yeah, it's just like it's not really a sword. It's like more of a letter opener, really. This sword isn't the biggest it, sword no, ever. No, it's a either. very tiny sword. It's like more of a dagger. So that's yeah. why that's why it was like, well, it's more of a letter opener. It is. And I gave it eight picture books because I love that scene. Yeah, that was great. All right. Uh, Moving on. Triple deckers. Can I just say, <laughs> triple deckers, <laughs> best scene ever. All right. The Flash 321, Cause and Effect. Yeah, written by Junalina Nira and Lauren Serto. Directed by David McWhirter. And... Yeah, ladies, you have some explaining to do. Yeah. Um, A story is plausible deniability. Right. B story, momentarily out of action, temporarily out of gas. Okay. Temporarily. I don't. I don't get the reference. It's Killer Flash, Killer Queen. Oh, Killer is uh, the song. Killer Queen. Oh, so Killer that's Frost. Right. Very well played. Okay. Killer Frost, but she's she's a killer. But she's Frost. working with them. Yeah. She's working with them instead of against them, so she's momentarily out of action. Right. Get it? Yep. Okay. Yep, I got it. Okay, and then not the study of gnats, armadillos, or snails. And that is a very obscure reference to a study that uh, they actually went into the genome of gnats, armadillos, and snails in order to find out how they were evolving. And they named part of the genome a bazooka. (laughs) How did you get that reference? It was something I read once, so okay. I looked it up. Okay. The, the the study is linked there if you feel like you want to read it. It's a lot of gobbledygook. But when I research about my MS, yeah, sometimes I come across a lot of weird stuff. Uh, understandable. <laughs> okay, I get it now. So, that makes sense. Uh, they name a lot of the genome stuff of these animals uh, after weapons. I don't know why. But this one is they have like uh, a Beretta, cooler. I guess a Beretta, a bazooka, some other guns. But uh, I said not the study of that. They're studying the what is it called the time bazooka? What the speed bazooka? What do you mean? I don't remember the one that they're trying to make, the bazooka. The doctor. Oh, oh, you mean, oh, you mean the, the yeah, the speed weapon. The, the, yeah, yeah. The, they the, call it the, a bazooka. The speed force cannon. They call it a bazooka. They call it a bazooka. I didn't remember. Yeah. They, I didn't know they actually called it a bazooka. Okay, they I did. Missed, I missed that part. Okay. Okay. I, was probably I think they t- call it a speed bazooka or a time bazooka yeah, or basi- something. Yeah, basically, it's this. Yeah, this thing that they want. Um, uh, Tracy, Tracy Brand to help create right yeah. so she's in there she's trying to come up with it of course they're trying to speed it up because she makes it in the future not now right uh and she's getting frustrated but hr comes in and tries to calm her down brings her more coffee because he's all about the coffee. oh and can i just say we've had some arguments <laughs> about this coffee uh that uh, me and Joe from Central City Underground love coffee, but don't put all that crap in it. No, no, just wrong. Don't put jasmine or whatever it is that they put in it. Yuck. Uh, but coffee's good. You like it black as midnight on a moonless night. I don't. I put a little bit of sugar and a little bit of cream in. Okay. Just to cut the oil a little bit. And I don't drink coffee. I drink tea, my dear. Oh, I know you do, but look, see? I ha- it's two cups of coffee each time in my coffee cup. Damn good tea. And, and it's a Copco cup trivia. Yeah. It's the same cup that they used on Castle. Right. But I had it before Castle started. I used these. I've been using these for years. 
So when they started using it on Castle, I was like, hey, those are the cups I use. <laughs> so okay. it's made by Copco. This is your coffee moment here on the Phantom Zone podcast. Coffee is important to me. It really is. Don't joke about my coffee, dude. All right. So anyway, uh, they're studying this bazooka and they have a moment. Damn good coffee. And hot. Yes, it needs to be hot, too. Damn good <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't like cold coffee. It's the worst. Right. So uh, they have this moment and they have a little smooch time. But they snap out of it and they decide they need to be uh, researching the gun. And she comes, of course, you remember this actress. You talked about it on yeah, the last yeah, podcast. We, yeah, we did. Ann Dudek, who has like, right. been on House right. and The Magicians. And she's been a lot of cool things. So I like her. Great uh, Covert Affairs, too. Right. I didn't watch uh, that show, but yeah. She was her sister on Covert Affairs. Uh, who was not in on the fact that she was an agent. It was a big storyline. So uh, She was a madman. Right. Uh, she was like a bitchy doctor on house. But I think it was kind of cool that she did the house thing on this episode. Where it was like, bling! And she had the answer all of a sudden. Right. To how to make the gun. So here, let me ask you, since I asked this of Phil... Mm-hmm. Do you think they're setting up Tracy to be Caitlin's replacement on this series? Yes, I think so. Or do you because think, I think or Caitlin's do you think they're gone. just trying to make you think they're getting rid of Caitlin when they're not going to get rid of Caitlin? Because they are working on a cure. I know, but I think Caitlin's turned. Okay. And I think she'd be cooler as Killer Frost. She anyway. is way cooler as Killer Frost. I think yeah. it'd shake the show up. I think it'd be great. Right. That's just me. I kind of want that to happen. And I love Andrew Dick. So I would love to see her on the show. Right? Yeah, yeah, she would be a great addition to the cast as far as I'm concerned. I agree. Yep. Uh, so I, I I wouldn't mind that at all. Right. Uh, and I think Caitlin staying on as Killer Frost would be good. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, so they come to a uh, a conclusion that the gun will work, but they need more power than what? The sun? Yeah. Yeah. Is that what they we need? need- 1.21 gigawatts. gigawatts. <laughs> oh, wait. No, no, no. 3.8 terajoules of energy to work. Right. But, of course, it's found only in one place. And then we cut to where that is. And it's a room that has apparently some alien technology left over from, Dominators. from the Dominators. I was just going to yep. say from the invasion. But guess who's guarding it? King Shark. King Shark. King Shark is back. King Shark's coming back. Yes. Now, can Gorilla Grodd come and fight I st- him? I still want my Gorilla Grodd versus King Shark. Me episode. too. Me too. But, I think that would be awesome. But it's not going to happen. It could. Not going to happen next week. It could. I'll just say that. It's, it's not, not going to happen, happen next, next week, but yeah, maybe someday. Maybe season four. It's, it has to happen. Right. Okay, so uh, the main storyline, though, is that Barry has lost his memory, right. which to me is this. <sighs> Right? I know, right? So overused. They might as well just uh, hit him on the head with a frying pan. Well, what I what frustrated me about this so much was that, and I know I guess this is like the point where Charles rants, right? So It's okay. But what really frustrates me about this, because you're as a season, as you're building toward that season finale, you're trying to make things more and more dramatic. You're trying to continually raise the tension which each episode but this episode does a big record scratch yeah and like hey it's wacky comedy where we have barry going like you know like oh what's this and oh i don't you know what are you doing who are you and oh i've got super speed really yeah <sighs> wackiness ensues. Terrible. dumb dumb idea Yes, it was terrible. This would, it was... Been, this would have been like a great, maybe, or at least a better season, like episode three of the yeah. season, but not here at episode 20. Right. It was terrible. Yeah. Just terrible. And this is why I hated this episode. Or 21, this episode. excuse me. 21. Hated. Yes. 
because it is so trite, so overused. Yep. The, you know, I'm going to lose my memory and then I'll get it back right at the well, right moment because that, of love. Right. And what else makes it worse is that, okay, Cisco does this. It's just on purpose. Yeah. Well, he does this and it's just, oh, wacky Cisco screws up and now Barry right. has no memory and doesn't remember he's the Flash. And then. Right. Everybody else, everything gets altered, and there's this whole because it's cause called cause, cause and effect. People, there's a domino <laughs> effect where um, future Barry, who was revealed to Savitar last week, um, he loses his speed because apparently it carries all the way through the continuum, right? And his memory, right? Which mm-hmm. would affect so many things. It wouldn't even we probably wouldn't Savitar wouldn't even exist, right? F- to begin with, right? But in the process, because Savitar created Wally, he loses he his, loses his kid flash powers. Right. This I know. Is, this is that was the sound of me hitting my head with my palm. Wouldn't Caitlin not be Killer Frost anymore? All kinds of things. But she yes. is still Killer Frost because right. she comes back and helps them to get Barry's memory back because she still wants to work with Savitar. Right. Who is giving her something in return, which I am assuming is going to be Ronnie. Well, the whole thing with Savitar, as we found out, we, we get an explanation at the beginning of this episode, is that Savitar is what Doctor Who nicely pointed out last year, is the big bootstrap paradox. Yep. Where Savitar is this temporal anomaly that Barry's future self created because he was trying to stop Savitar, so essentially Savitar creates himself. Right. He's a time remnant. Yes. He's not Barry. So, and he's all happy because Team Flash didn't consider him the real Barry. Right. (sighs) So he resents everything, (laughs) he hates everything. He's emo Barry, emo not Barry. Yeah, he's emo Barry. He's emo not Barry. Right. Because... He's really not Barry. And, uh, yeah. So we we learned that he is Barry last week, and then this week he's not Barry. It's so... Kind of. So needlessly convoluted. Yes. And the thing is that, yes, I kind of predicted this, but I'm so disappointed. Right. It, that was going to be... Well, a lot, of, a lot of us predicted this. Yeah. It was... We hoped they wouldn't be this obvious, but... I know. But, but Phil, there it is. But uh, credit to Phil, he pointed out that hey, well, they used the blue lightning from the future flash from the new Fifty Two. Yep. So it made sense. It did. It did. So. All right. So there's that, and of course, Iris loves this Barry because he is not burdened by the weight He's of happy, his mother carefree. dying. And his father dying, and he, you know he, he's, walking he's the on, berry. He's walking on sunshine. Right. Whoa! He's the berry that she remembers before he came to live with them. Right. And he, you know, she kind of digs this berry, and uh, they decide. You and Joe, know, he, Joe has to tell her, "Look, he's not the berry we know. He's not the berry we need." Right. And. While she says, yeah, but, you know, we love each other still, and he wants to get married still, and he's still Barry. Right. Maybe we can teach him to be the Flash. Yeah. Joe says, no, you know, that dark part of him is part of him. Right. We need to get it back. And apparently, because Barry has no memory, this Barry, he has no memory of his CSI background. So, therefore, when he gets called in to be a witness at a trial for the lame heat wave replacement heat monger heat monger because apparently heat wave is busy i got things to do well he's in the time stream yeah, he's in the time stream so we have to come up with it we couldn't get another rogue we had to come up with a heat monger right yeah uh so he's there to testify against heat monger who heats up the room which okay he's wearing these glasses that uh What's his name? Can Cisco. type Cisco? Can not be... Cisco. Oh, I mean Julian. Julian yeah, yeah. types into a computer and it shows up on the glasses. It's like a Google glasses thing, yeah, right? And uh, he puts smileys in, which Barry seriously. Why would he put emojis in? 
That's yeah. that's just ridiculous. It's not like Julian. It's out of character completely for Julian. And not just that. Poor, but poor writing. If Barry remembers what life is like, he wouldn't read them, right? Right. I mean, he forgets his his life specifically, but he remembers like how to read and stuff. So he knows what emojis are. Yeah, well, Julian's this big, super serious guy, so it's totally, like you said, totally out of character. Right. So he reads that, but Heatmonger's heating up the room, and Barry sweats, and he shorts out the glasses. So in the end, Heatmonger goes free and causes a problem, which Barry tries to solve because he does kind of know how to use his speed at one point, but he can't really use it, and they Cisco decides he's going to reverse it. And Iris has to have a pep talk over the thing because he has to do it for love, which again is just a, I rolled well, my I, eyes I did so like, hard. I did like the Iris speech. I did like that, but how many times have we done it? Four. It, it's been done. It's like yeah, we we don't we, we don't need Iris to constantly have to keep reminding Barry that she loves him, and right? And he loves her. Four or five, and remember, she didn't know for all of season right, one. Right. So, <laughs> four in two seasons, yeah, too many times. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that I rolled my eyes so hard through this whole episode. I think my eye sockets hurt by the end of it. <laughs> so, she says, okay, it's going to hurt. And then Cisco does the thing, and he remembers everything. He saves the day, of course. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. I, I can't think of anything else. Well, just yeah, it's um, well. We also have this like they they take down Killer Frost, right? And Julian is all like, you know, hey, I can oh, fix, right. I can fix you, and I love you. And then Killer Frost like shoots him down cold. Get it? I never loved you. I never loved you. And I never loved any of you. Yeah, exactly. And then off she goes. Yeah, so it's just like. Snaps her fingers, like, does, like, I'm out the door. Bye. And she makes, like, an ice bridge and she leaves. Right. And she goes back to Savitar. And I know she loved them. Right. But she can get something if she goes with Savitar. And I, again, I think it's Ronnie. But it's so trite, the whole thing. And, yeah. And, uh, well, they, and, they, and they brought up Ronnie earlier. You mentioned this because there was a scene where uh, there were, Cisco, Julian, and, and Killer Frost are working together, um, and then Cisco begins telling Julian about a story about working with Ronnie on the particle accelerator because he's trying to bring Caitlin back. Mm-hmm. And, and she does say the line that Ronnie said. Yes. In the memory. Right. So there's a little bit of a softening there. Yeah. So there but... is that like, well, the real Caitlin's still in there somewhere. Right. So. And that's part of why I think she thinks that uh, Savitar is going to bring back Ronnie. Yeah. So, yeah, there's that. And again, I roll. Yes. Because changing time is bad. And she should know that. She should, shouldn't she? Yes. All right. So there, I, I can't think of anything else. All right. I was so, just so, so mad. Go ahead and give your rating. Seven goodbye Felicia's because he thought that Cecile's name was Felicia. Yeah, I kept waiting for that joke. It didn't happen. I'm surprised. It was an obvious joke. Well, I made it. Yeah, I, that? I made I made I made it on Twitter when I was yeah. live tweeting that. I was just like, Okay, <laughs> goodbye Felicia. Bye Felicia. Right. Um I was a little more generous, but I still did not like this episode. Seven and a half Horrible. seven and a half mind wipe hair dryers. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. Flash writers were so disappointed in you. Yes. Yeah. And I hate to do this, but that's how we're going to end up with 103. Yeah, but, A. But uh better stuff in part B, part 2. That's right. So, yeah, uh, in part 2 we're going to cover um I Zombie 306 uh Arrow or excuse me, Agents of Shield 4 uh season 4 episode 21. Arrow episode f- or season five episode twenty one and Iron Fist finally getting to episode seven of Iron Fist the long delayed right. episode seven right so come on uh, back y'all 
So again, at Fandom Zone Cast, at Alvaria, at Charles Skaggs, uh, Fandom Zone Podcast on Facebook, Fandom Zone Cast at gmail.com, and listen and subscribe to us in Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Yep. So there's that, and here we go. <laughs> Wow.